All right, if everybody could take a seat, I, I've been told we can start, so I'll give everybody just a minute. All right, I'd like to um, thank you all for joining us here at the third, I think, of four um, uh, 2023 seminars uh, of the Biotech Connector Speaker Series. Um, we'd like to welcome our audience here at the Advanced Technology Research Facility uh, in Frederick and everyone joining us online. I am Len Friedman, uh, the Chief Science Officer here at the Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research, and it's a pleasure to join you all here. Uh, the Biotech Connector event is a collaboration with the Frederick National Lab and the Frederick County Chamber of Commerce. This event is an exclusive quarterly series, as I mentioned, that brings together the local biotech community for an inside look at advances, uh, a chance to share expertise, as well as an opportunity to network with other scientists and entrepreneurs. Likewise, the Frederick National Lab is a collaborative enterprise as well. We are always interested in partnering opportunities, uh, just as uh, many of you uh, who are here today are. Uh, we engage with outside organizations through subcontracting, and those contract solicitations are available for review on our website. You should check it out. We have many career opportunities also posted on our website uh, if you're looking for that. Please refer to, switch the slides, um, info on this particular slide um, and also in the chat box. So let's start our program for today. Um, uh, and, but, but first, but first, let's go through the logistics um, and we'll move through the three speakers that are uh, presenting today and we'll have time for a couple of questions after each speaker. When prompted either, please stand up and state your question, submit your questions in the chat box, or unmute yourself to ask a question. For online folks, please remain muted during the presentations and turn off your camera. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing the three speakers for uh, this morning's event. First, um, a guy who needs no introduction, at least here at FNL, Dr. Dom Esposito, who is the RAS Initiative Reagents and Research Team Lead. He's also the director of our Protein Expression Laboratory in the Cancer Research Technology uh, Directorate here again at the FNL. As the leader of the Protein Expression Lab, Dom's team is responsible for production of proteins from a, a variety of host uh, organisms in support of the NCI RAS Initiative, for investigators at the NCI in general and other NIH facilities, which you'll, I'm sure, hear about in Dom's talk. In addition, the Protein Expression Lab invents and develops novel technologies uh, for improving protein expression and production, focusing heavily on baculovirus expression technology and combinatorial cloning. Our second speaker is Dr. Jonathan Zamuda. He is the Director of Cell Biology R&D at Thermo Fisher Scientific, located here in Frederick. Dr. Zamuda's team develops new products for various applications, including viral vector production for cell and gene therapy, transient protein expression, and nucleic acid delivery. Our third speaker is Dr. Carter Mitchell. He's the CSO for Kemp Proteins leading a team of over 40 researchers in the rapid development of novel proteins. Dr. Mitchell is a protein chemist and structural biologist with more than 20 years of direct experience in isolating and characterizing proteins from a variety of recombinant and natural sources. Currently, he is the PI for numerous government antigen and mono monoclonal antibody programs. Okay, with that, let's, in let's bring up our first speaker, Again, he needs no introduction, Dr. Dom Esposito. Oops. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming out early this morning. I'm gonna start us off by talking a little bit about um, the challenges that we face producing high quality recombinant protein reagents um, for cancer drug discovery and maybe some of the solutions that we're working on and that other people are working on. 
So uh, just as a way of introduction, although Len already gave kind of a little background on this, the, um, the Protein Expression Lab here at FNL um, has the role of providing DNA, cell line, and protein reagents to a variety of different programs, either within Frederick National Lab or within the National Institutes of Health. We support a number of different initiatives as shown here, including um, a variety of NCI intramural investigators at the Center for Cancer Research, uh, as well as DCTD. We also support other NIH institutes, mainly NCATS, the uh, Translational Sciences Group down in Rockville, and NIAD, the Infectious Disease Group. And in the last three or four years, not surprisingly, we've um, spun up a group that works on COVID-19 protein production for serology support. But the main focus really of probably about 60% of the lab is actually the NCI's RAS initiative, which I'll talk about in a minute. And as Len pointed out, the other thing that we do in addition to generating all these reagents is to try and improve technologies around protein production. Um, and so we focus very heavily on new enhancements to protein expression systems. A lot of these are focused on insect technologies, but also process improvements across all the different expression systems and purification technologies. Um, and I'll touch on a few of those as we go on. Like a lot of labs um, that, that do protein production for a living, we, um, we structure our group in sort of an iterative fashion. Uh, we have a cloning group that generates all the DNAs that are required for protein production. Most of this done using combinatorial cloning using the gateway system. And then DNAs are passed on to one of the two expression groups, either a microbial fermentation group that does E. coli and Vibrio natriagens production, again, from very micro scale up to 60 liter fermenters, or an, a eukaryotic expression group that carries out all the insect and mammalian expression work um, and handles a lot of our baculovirus work. And then all of those expression materials are shunted downstream to the largest group in the lab, which is the protein purification group, which does all of the protein production, starting from micro scale scouting to try and reduce costs and timelines to large scale production, which can be anywhere from milligrams to grams of protein. And that group's also responsible for the, the QC suite that I'll touch on a little bit here and, and really ensuring that the protein quality is maintained. We also have a cell line development group that actually generates cell lines for the RAS initiative specifically from DNAs that we generate, and then some uh, additional work that supports our technology development operations. For those who aren't familiar with the RAS program, just very quickly, the, the RAS initiative is uh, um, an NCI-directed FNL-run initiative, uh, the goal of which is to generate uh, new drugs to target RAS-driven cancers. So this includes most of the the most serious and deadly cancers, pancreas cancer, a large chunk of colorectal and lung cancer driven by this oncogene RAS. And the goal here is really to carry out basic biology to understand the RAS pathway and the effect of RAS mutations, but also to actually develop compounds and get them into the clinic to, to target RAS-driven cancers. And to do that, we've built a group of um, somewhere around 70 FTEs in a number of different areas shown here. A lot of them are obviously supporting biochemistry, biophysics, biochemical assay development, and structural biology, all in support of longer-term drug discovery efforts, um, which involve medicinal chemistry, computational chemistry, uh, and actual drug discovery. But sort of underpinning all of this is the need for reagents across this program. So again, DNA, protein, protein and cell line reagents used within the RAS initiative, but also shared with the extramural community, um, uh, of which there are many, many RAS researchers. And so our our reagents are used for work here, for work outside, and in all cases, we really have to pay careful attention to the quality of the reagents we're generating so that they're more useful downstream. So one, one of the folks in my lab had used this slide many years ago, and I stole it. So th this quote, I think, is, is excellent for, for sort of our philosophy of making proteins, right? Every day we make it, we will make it the best we can. So for those who don't know who this is, this is Jack Daniel. Um, the same rules apply, I think, for making good whiskey as making proteins. If you would prefer the more scientific vision of this, um, Arthur Kornberg, who's probably the, the father of biochemistry, in his, his famous Ten Commandments paper, uh, his fourth commandment was, do not waste clean thinking on dirty enzymes. Uh, and I think that's the sort of science view of this. And this is borne out by some research done a number of years ago by our CSO, Len Friedman, uh, which showed that about half of the estimated U.S. annual preclinical spending um, on research led to irreproducible results. That's, that's $28 billion a year, and this was in 2015, so, so we only could guess what it is now. And the majority of that uh, irreproducibility was due to biological reagents and reference materials. So basically, um, bad reagents um, 
used in good experiments. So what kinds of examples do we have? And, and most of what's on this list are things I've personally experienced, and probably many of you who work with proteins have experienced as well. You can have um, incorrect DNA sequences. So you get a plasmid from somebody, and it's got mistakes in it, or it's the wrong isoform, or it's mouse, not human. Um, you can have contaminated cell lines, so contaminated with mycoplasma, contaminated with viruses, or as we all know, um, just the wrong cell line. So um, everybody's experienced the phenomenon of a cell line that turns out to be HeLa that's not supposed to be. Um, antibodies that fail to work is a huge problem in the field. Um, they may be not the advertised specificity, not the advertised selectivity, and again, those have significant effects on downstream work. And then from, from my perspective, the biggest problem is poor quality protein reagents. So they can be things like proteolysis or mutations or just the wrong protein, or they can be, and I won't name the company here, but a, a product here, which is uh, listed in the catalog as 95% pure, which I think we would all agree that's probably not the case. In some cases, they have to put a little arrow next to the gel to show where the protein is because there's so many bands. So this, this is all a major problem for us. And it's not just the cost of the actual experiment, because that's bad enough, but it's the time and effort involved and the labor of reproducing this that really kills us. So, so these are the challenges we face. Um, recombinant protein production is expensive and very time consuming. There's a lot of development involved in the process. And drug discovery and structural biology in particular, you need a lot of very highly pure protein. And the other issue is that we've moved on from sort of the low hanging fruit in the field, things that we can make in E. coli that are really easy, to things that are more complex. So they have post-translational modifications or they're multi-protein complexes, and they require more alternative expression hosts and the downstream work requires these very specific modifications. So we've moved away from a, a time when we can just do a gel analysis and say, yeah, the protein looks good, it's a single band, it, it must be what we want. So we here, and, and by no means is this unique to us, um, a lot of groups that work on proteins have done a similar thing, but we've developed a sort of 21st century QC suite for recombinant proteins. And it involves a wide variety of technologies, some of which we use pretty much for all proteins that we make as sort of the baseline QC, but then depending on the specific needs of the protein that we're working with or the customer we're working with, we can add in some of these other technologies. And the key here is that taken together, these techniques can give a very clear view of all of the factors we need to know. So protein size, shape, purity, whether it's aggregated or not, how it behaves. Um, and that really provides us the, the assurance that the downstream users are going to be able to get good data out of these proteins. I'm just going to very briefly touch on two of these to highlight um, technologies that we've really brought into the lab over the last five years or so, um, which are essential techniques now. Um, one of them is um, electrospray ionization mass spectrometry. Uh, so this has become a key for us in terms of validating the quality and the details of every protein that we make. So this is basically top-down mass determination of intact proteins, and it gives you the size of your protein, and by that size you can infer the various modifications on your protein and also validate that it is what you think it is. So using this, you can, you can see things like post-translational modifications. We do a lot of work with phosphorylated proteins, so this helps identify phosphorylations. We can identify if a protein is proteolized in a subtle way that maybe we couldn't see on a gel. Um, that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes that helps us inform the way we design our constructs to take a stable part of the protein and produce it. We can see things that um, often haven't been observed. So um, when you secrete proteins out of mammalian cells, there's a signal sequence that gets cleaved off. And the computer algorithms tell you where that cleavage occurs, but it turns out that in reality, that actually isn't as accurate as people think it is. Many of the proteins that we've secreted actually have variations in where that signal sequence cleavage occurs. But at the basic level, one of the most useful things with this technology is the first one, right, which is the wrong protein. And so obviously, if you're making a 100 kilodalton protein and you get a band on a gel that looks like 10 kilodaltons, you know there's a problem. But what if you have proteins that are almost identical? And so in our case, we make a lot of mutants of the same protein. So in this case, KRAS, we make point mutants, indistinguishable by gel or literally any other means. But mass spectrometry can identify problems. And in fact, earlier this year, we had such a problem um, where the mass spec results on three different protein lots came back. And we were able to identify that we had swapped those samples. And so a mutant that we thought was an arginine mutation was actually a leucine mutation. And all of that was easily determined by the mass 
spectrum. We were able to quickly fix this problem before we delivered proteins to downstream clients. Uh, 10 years ago, we would have had no idea, right? 10 years ago, we would have seen the band on a gel and said, this is the right protein, go for it. And that's, again, potential huge issue for, um, for the downstream folks. The, the other um, procedure I want to mention quickly is differential scanning fluorimetry, uh, also known as thermal melting or thermofluor. The idea here is that you can measure the temperature at which your protein melts as you ramp the temperature up. So you, uh, you mix your protein with this dye called cipro orange. That dye can only bind to tryptophan residues. Those are only exposed when a protein unfolds. So as you slowly heat this protein up in a PCR machine, the protein begins to melt. It binds this dye and fluoresces, and you can measure the fluorescence. And we define this melting temperature as the inflection point of this, uh, the slope of this line here. Not, this is not a useful number per se by itself to know what temperature a protein melts at, but what it is really good for is batch to batch reproducibility testing. So in theory, if your protein behaves the same way and is purified the same way, it should have the same melting temperature all the time. And so we can use this to do batch to batch experiments. And as an example, here is some DSF data for a variety of proteins we've made multiple batches of. You can see here that protein A, three different batches of protein with basically the same TM, same thing for protein B, protein C. You can see the proteins all have different melting temperatures themselves. That, again, is not as relevant. But here in protein D, we have two preps that gave 52 degrees and one prep that gave a very anomalous low reading, suggesting that there's something wrong with that prep. Something went wrong during the production. So we would, we would not pass that protein. We can also use DSF to monitor the impact of mutations on proteins. So here's a protein. When we make a couple mutants, we don't change the TM. But then this mutant 3 and mutant 4 have a pretty dramatic impact on uh, the behavior of that protein. So again, this may highlight some residues that are important for maintaining the structural integrity of those proteins. So just sort of to summarize, I think the point I've reinforced many times here, the, the amount of downstream effort in the groups that we give proteins to, to do assay development and drug screening is really high. Um, any unexpected variability in the quality of the proteins or delivery of wrong proteins is a lot of time and money for them. Uh, and if we give them proteins that don't have the specific modifications and requirements that they want, again, not very useful. And since proteins really are the main gateway reagent for all of the work that's done here in our structural biology group to support drug discovery, um, you know, the structural biologists will tell you that, that garbage in is garbage out. If they get a bad quality protein, they're not going to get a good structure out of it. So the more complicated the experiment they have, the more demands they have for high quality. And as we progress through different forms of structural biology from the sort of old school x-ray crystallography to things like NMR and now cryo-EM, each of these experiments have a very different set of demands. And fortunately for us, we've, we've been able to provide good quality reagents for the structural biology groups here. Um, since the RAS initiative started in 2013, we've had more than 20 publications now of uh, structures of proteins that are generated at Pell, uh, including both x-ray, NMR, and cryo-EM. And just shown here are some of the unique protein complexes that had not previously been um, identified. Uh, and I think most of these are um, X-ray crystallography structures, but we also have a cryo-EM structure of, uh, of neurofibromin. So I think this bears out the fact that the attention to detail and the quality up front um, is, is dramatically important for the downstream results. Um, in the last two minutes, I just want to highlight a couple things that are not related really to what I said, but I think is good for this audience, um, for those who aren't familiar with this. One is to sort of reintroduce um, the FNL Scientific Standards Hub. So this was, this was really um, an idea, I think, that Len started to come up with a centralized location for researchers to share standards, standardization practices, SOPs, references across not just protein science, but a number of different fields. And the fields are all shown here uh, on the right. This is um, accessible on the FNL website. And you can go to these different groups, and there are a number of protocols and, and information about standardization. And really, the idea is to try and sort of get the community to collaborate together to address these issues that I talked about on that earlier slide with poor quality reagents. Um, and so it's worth checking um, this out. And, and so I'm, I'm involved in the protein science group of this. And one of the things that we've recently spun, sort of spun out of this, is a group that we call the PIG. It's the protein interest group. And the idea here was to generate a community of protein science researchers 
Uh, we focus really on topics relevant to protein production from core labs or um, CROs or groups and companies that generate proteins, really focused around the sort of thing I talked about here. How do we keep up the standards? How do we deal with problems? Um, we have monthly Zoom meetings the second Friday of every month with talks from various members of the group and invited speakers, but also just a general discussion of topics. We have a LinkedIn online forum to allow people to exchange questions and answers. You know, hey, what do you guys use for this? You know, what do you think of this equipment? Um, and a mailing list that we sort of use for meeting info. And I'm going to mention in a slide in a minute that we have a, a conference coming up. But so if people are interested in joining this, the LinkedIn group is private, but you can find it and just uh, apply online and, and the moderators will accept people. And we have, I think we have about 100 people on there already. So trying to get the word out and sort of... Um, and boost interest in this. And, and one of the things we're doing, again, thanks to um, Len and the folks here in the partnership office, is um, we're going to have a meeting here live on site in March. Uh, it'll be March 21st and 22nd, uh, the twists and turns of recombinant protein production. And you know the goal is to get people, uh, both those who are already members of this protein interest group, but also all the local folks here who like to work on proteins, to come and we're going to have short talks, we're going to do poster sessions, we're going to have a lot of roundtable discussions. Basically, we want to just sit down and get everybody in the same room and kind of hash out, hey, here are our problems, we all have the same problems, what do, what do we do to solve them? Um, the, the plan is for this to be cheap, we're, not, we're going for a really low registration cost to get people involved, we're going to try and get some sponsors to pay for food. We'll have details soon, uh, we're working out all the issues here, but again, if you're interested in finding out about this, either join the protein interest group, email me, email somebody here and um, we can keep everybody informed. We'll probably have registration coming up in a little while. I, I, don't, I don't do any of the work that I show here. All this work is done by, by folks in my group, many of whom are listed here. Um, a shout out to Bill Gillette, who's here in the audience, who runs all of our protein purification group and is actually the one who's really developed a lot of the QC work. So you can address questions afterwards as well. But thanks for your attention. Happy to, uh, to answer questions. Just have some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the with the RAS point mutations, do you are you mass specking every protein you made? Yep. Or every. How do you? How did you? No, every protein. Every protein. No, no protein leaves the group without mass spec. It's it's absolutely required. Um, we we learn a lot that way. A lot of unexpected things. <laughs> yeah. Regarding that, John, on the TikTok, but regarding mass spec, um, I find that some protein targets are quite tricky. Developing a method that would be able to give you the appropriate data. Yeah. Uh, so we have all yeah. we we have really good mass spec people here, um, and and so they have been amazing at developing these parameters. Um, you know, not to not to embarrass anyone sitting in the room, but we we have a we have a three hundred and twenty kilodalton protein that we've done by top down. Uh, it's it's. I don't think there's been a protein yet that they can analyze. So uh, maybe maybe one thing to discuss in the future is actually sharing some of the tri tricks and tips that we have. So yeah, it's it, it's definitely challenging. I'm not going to pretend that every protein works the first time using the same process, but we've been pretty we've been pretty lucky. So. Yeah. We have this conference in March. We were talking to other stakeholders. We thought about using some documents or standards that we could disseminate beyond the user group. The scientists have to be part of the solution for the perceived problem of litigation. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree. Ultimately, the goal for sure. So I, I will point out there's a group in Europe that's kind of analogous to what we're doing called the P4EU. And they, a few years ago, did that. They got together a bunch of people. They wrote a white paper. They published it. I have to say they didn't publish it in a particularly high prestige, high impact journal. And I don't know that anybody actually read it outside of the stakeholders. Um, but I would love to do that. I, I think we start by getting this group together, kind of coming up with some rules. The problem, of course, is then 
enforcing this, right? And and you know, Len knows this from it, we can tell people to wear blue in the face that this is the case, and yet we we can't stop companies from making crappy antibodies, and we can't stop them from publishing, you know, eighty percent pure proteins. So I I think some of it's the 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 journals need to be better at this. They need to ask better questions. Um, the granting agencies need to look at this more carefully. But um, yeah, I think we can do our part by getting some white paper out there, by publishing some information. That would be good. I say there's so much skepticism about science and scientists. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. John, take it away. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dom, and, and thanks uh, to Luba for organizing this event and <clears throat> giving us the invite. Um, as mentioned, um, my name is John Zamuda, Director of Cell Biology R&D at our Frederick, Maryland site, just a couple of, uh, couple of exits south of here on, uh, on 270. And um, today I want to, you know, just give a little bit of a, a lighthearted presentation um, focusing on the, the HEC 293 cell line. Um, going from, you know, its origins uh, for protein expression to, to viral vector production for cell and gene therapy today. A uh, little bit of background on the cell line and, um, you know, go into uh, how, how these amazing cells are, are now being utilized for, for many different purposes. So um, certainly uh, many folks that are involved in doing recombinant protein expression transiently have, have come across Thermo Fisher reagents in their, in their workflows. Um, and really the, the 293 line, just to give a little bit of background, the human embryonic uh, kidney cell line was first uh, isolated in, in 1973 in the, the Van der Ebb lab over in Leiden, uh, Netherlands. And um, this cell line, you know, initially was thought to be either fibroblast, endothelial, epithelial in origin. Uh, much more likely, it's probably an adrenal uh, neuron cell line, um, which is which is quite interesting. And that that cell line was made through um, uh, transformation with a adenov adenovirus five sheared uh, sheared DNA uh, with an integration site into into chromosome nineteen that um, imparts the, the E1A and E1B genes that uh, essentially immortalize the, the 293 cell line. So it was very fortuitous, you know, that many decades ago that this was the, the way these cells happened to be immortalized uh, because it, it turns out these E1A and E1B genes are very important then for, for making viruses uh, in, in this cell line. <clears throat> so if we, you know, step back to the original role of these cells in, in protein expression, um, and, and or for making models, you know, some of the key advantages of the, the, the great 293 cell line um, is that it is a, a very robust and scalable cell line uh, from serum containing adherent cultures, you know, through shake flasks and, and what we'll show today up to thousands of liters of production. Um, usually thousands of liters of production tends to be the Cho realm. Right. And, um, you know, what what we're finding is that, you know, Cho was always the big player. You know, that's where you're going to get your 10,000, 20,000 liter reactors. But this interesting little cell line that nobody would have ever thought could compete in that space um, certainly seems to be quite scalable and quite amenable to even large scale transient production of, uh, of uh, viral vectors. Um, the 293 line, as it's coming from a human origin, has uh, human like post translational modifications. And these cells have always been noted to be easy to transfect. So whether you're making a stable cell line model or for recombinant proteins, uh, they're relatively easy to get uh, exogenous DNA into them. And very flexible expression of secreted proteins, intracellular proteins, membrane proteins, whereas CHO tends to be um, thought of as the sort of the one trick pony for antibody and antibody like molecules. The 293 cells have become the, the real workhorse of protein expression. And so if you, you know, if you had to have only one cell line for your lab that's, that's generating a lot of different types of proteins, you know, most labs will start with the 293 cells just because of the, the broad breadth of proteins that, that can be expressed in these cells. And as I mentioned, these cells p possess the adenoviral 5, E1A, and E1B uh, genes. And this makes them actually excellent platforms for, for virus production. So just to give a little bit of background into uh, adeno-associated virus. So adeno-associated virus, AAV, was initially found as a contaminant of adenovirus preparations. So the adenovirus is a, a dependovirus. So it's dependent upon co-infection with another virus for in vivo replication. 
Um, it does have one of the challenges. It has a relatively small 4.7 KB uh, single-stranded DNA genome, and that's surrounded by your VP123 capsid proteins. Um, and really, the, the advantages of uh, AAV for gene therapy is that the virus itself is, is non-pathogenic. It does infect dividing and non-dividing cells, and you have numerous uh, serotypes existing naturally with di different tissue specificities. And obviously, one of the main thrusts going forward is, is engineering these capsid proteins for, for further specificity uh, compared to the, the, the natural variants. Um, and the recombinant AAV, which is ma it maintains itself as a extra chromosomal DNA in the host cells. So within, within gene therapy applications, uh, it should be non-integrative in, into the human cells. So um, I list, um, you know, we, we've had recent approvals um, in the uh, gene therapy space for AAV. List out the seven here. Glybera was the very first one that was made in insect cells. Um, it was eventually pulled from the market simply because the partially at least because the, the, the production costs were, were so great that it was very difficult to, to sustain that. Um, but you can see, you know, down from there, we've got six other uh, therapies that are, that are approved in this space um, and uh, with, a, with a couple coming uh, very recently, mostly in these rare disease spaces, though. And just um, looking, and actually I'll get into this in the next slide a little bit as well. Um, but so far, if we, if we look through, search through the databases, um, there's at least 136 unique clinical trials for, for AAV, um, and this uh, targets 50, 55 different disease uh, areas, including eye, liver, muscles, and, and CNS are, are the top uh, targets. The original AAV2 um, uh, capsid uh, or, or AAV serotype remains the most common, partly because it's, it's off patent. Um, uh, otherwise, because it's been uh, utilized for much development in the AAV space, but eight and nine are, are very uh, becoming very popular due to their, their CNS uh, applications. Um, and certainly, the ability to target to other organs with great specificity in terms of capsid engineering, et cetera, um, as well as synthetic promoters that will only express in certain tissues is a, uh, a common theme in, in AAV uh, biology today. So at the bottom you see, um, again, this is fairly rare disease settings. Um, so, you know, that number, uh, greater than 3,000 patients treated over, over 20 years of clinical trials for AAV. So it's not, it's still not a huge number of patients. And certainly as we talk about getting into indications where the patient population is much larger, we have to be able to make AAV at much larger scales in order, in order to support those indications. So just a little bit about um, how to produce recombinant AAV in, in the 293 cell line. Um, so if you look at the, uh, uh, on the top, you have sort of the, um, the endogenous AAV genome where you have your, your rep and your, your capsid proteins flanked on either sides by the in inverted terminal repeats. And uh, in essence, what's been happening, what, what we've done is, is gutted out the rep and cap, and then we uh, insert in its place a gene of interest uh, up to about 4.7 KB. There, there are um, some other strategies of doing this where for larger genes, you might actually introduce two different AAVs and, and have the gene product come together within the cells. And then the, the rep and cap proteins are then delivered in trans on a separate plasmid, um, a, as well as additional helper functions on, a, on a, an a additional plasmid. So very typically in the mammalian setting, this is a triple transfection with three different, uh, three different plasmids, one encoding your gene of interest, the other rep cap, and, and finally the helper plasmids. So we're introducing a fair amount of DNA into these cells um, and in a manner where all three of these plasmids have to be productively expressed within the cells in order to get uh, viral, viral production. Uh, shown on the right, just some gels look, looking at, and this actually came from, from insect work, but the different rep and, and cap proteins so the VP1, VP2, VP3, uh, typically in mammalian cells, you'll, you'll see a 10 to 1 to 1 ratio of these, um, and then sort of uh, still um, a workhorse for characterization of these, uh, the, the TEM of purified AAV6 particles, and uh, sort of uh, in contrast to what you would expect to see, your empty particles sort of has, have this electron-dense core to them, versus these, um, your full particles are, are the ones that look more, uh, more uniform in terms of their, their TEM brightness. Okay. So again, um, multiple methods for making uh, AAV. Uh, as, as I'm talking uh, today, the HEC-293 triple transfection, um, I will say there are teams that are doing this with two plasmids and even just one plasmid at this point, um, uh, as well as uh, insect uh, baculovirus infection. So baculovirus 
very early on in gene therapy, I would say, was a, uh, was a common production methodology. And often, very interestingly, as, as, um, as uh, researchers would, would move through clinical trials, they would often start in HEC-293 cells because it was fast and easy transiently, and then they would actually transition. This could be after phase one, phase two, they would transition wholesale into insect systems because they, insect systems were um, thought to be inherently scalable and cheaper in terms of the productivity of, of, of the, the AAV. I would say that there's probably a shift going on there right now, um, and some of the data I'll show in the next slides is that the 293 cells are very inherently scalable. Um, and so I think that that has uh, that misnomer of the cells has, has taken a little bit of the advantage away from using the insect cells. And I think there's still discussions around the quality of the AAV coming out of the 293 versus, versus insect cells with new analytics in place that are allowing much deeper dives into the, into the quality of the, of the particles, you know, we're seeing that the 293 cells really provide um, very high quality uh, AAV. And so um, I would say that there seems to be a little bit of a shift moving um, towards staying in 293 cells all the way through uh, to, to commercial production. And certainly at Thermo, we, we have two different offerings um, along these lines for triple mammalian transfection, our AAV max system, um, and for insect cells, our, our XPSF production system uh, for generating the AAV in, in insect cells. So just go quickly through this. Um, I, I won't go into much detail, but for those of you that have worked with, for example, our expression systems, XP293, XPCHO, we try to take a holistic approach of developing these systems such that all of the components of the system interact synergistically to give you your, your best viral titers um, and your best quality of, of AAV. So in the case of our AAV Max system, this, this comprises our, our viral production cells 2.0, so a, a GMP-banked clonal 293F derivative cell line, uh, as well as, as uh, matched viral production media and liquid AGT formats, transfection reagents and boosters to allow for a high efficiency transfection with, with larger amounts of, of large plasmids. Um, complexation buffer, uh, enhancer, and then finally a lysis buffer such that uh, the users have an end-to-end -end solution for preparing their, their AAV from bench scale all the way through using our, our CTS, our, our cell therapy systems products, through commercial production. And I'll just take a moment to go over some of the, the key characteristics of the VPC2 cell line um, as we're talking, focusing a little bit about, you know, these remarkable 293 cells today. So the VPC2 cell line is a, is a clonally derived um, uh, cell line uh, from our, our 293F lineage. Um, these cells, as you can see here in our imaging, started off as a single cell divided into two and then rapidly took off in culture. Um, these cells uh, will attain very high densities in suspension culture. So in a typical shake flask, you're probably at 12 to 15 million. Um, they also have interesting uh, characteristics in terms of their resistance to, for example, osmotic stress that allows them to be intensified to, to very high densities um, as well. Uh, they do uh, generate high, title, high titer viral vector production. These cells have no large T antigen from a regulatory standpoint. One of the key aspects of any transient line, they have to be non-clumping so that you can easily uh, get them through your seed train and transfect them, uh, have robust scalability, fast recovery post-thaw so that you can get into your seed train quickly, and these cells uh, do grow a little bit faster than, uh, for example, uh, the XB293 cell line, so the, the doubling time is a, is a bit shorter for this cell line. And I'm going to jump through some of these pretty quickly, but just some of the key characteristics that makes this cell line quite good. Um, you know, we have, if we look at uh, the recovery of these cells post-thaw, you know, really from thaw to day one, two, you're already getting into your, um, you know, nice log phase growth within a couple days, which again is, is important for seed trains. The, the doubling time is very stable from eight to, eight to 46 passages so that you have consistent growth of the cells for setting up your seed train. Growth curves across multiple passages are, are highly consistent, and, and as mentioned, these cells are very um, singular in, in, in terms of their uh, morphology. So here at a 5 million cell per mil uh, density, you essentially see no clumping of the cells. Uh, and then looking at, for example, we have to look at passage stability in terms of uh, multiple AAV serotypes. Between passage 3 and 25, we have uh, excellent consistency of production. And if we look at these cells, this cell line, VPC2 versus the, the parental VPC cell line, you can see the amazing difference in, in titers that we achieve through the VPC 2.0 cell line. 
um, compared to the, the VPC line. So this can be from five to 20 fold improvements um, by using this, this clonal cell line. So I'm gonna skip over uh, these next two slides and I wanna get into just a, an interesting case study. This is production of a, a GFP encoding AAV6 at the 1000 liter transient scale in, in single use bioreactors. Um, so um, here, this was all done with our, our AAV Max system, utilizing our either our high performa or our Dynadrive single use bioreactors. And um, what we you know saw when we when we started this work, we began all this work in benchtop three liter stirred tank reactors, glass reactors. We moved that directly into fifty liter uh, single use bioreactors uh, shown here where in terms of the seed train for the 1,000 liter uh, AAV6 run, we started with uh, 10 liters in our 50 liter bioreactor. And this is all compared to a 125 ml shake flask. And then that seed train went to 50 liters in a 50 liter reactor, and then inoculated 300 liters in a 5,000 liter reactor, all the way up to your final 900 liter volume in preparation for your transfection and the addition of all the subsequent reagents would get up to about 1,000 liters at that time. And what was really quite striking here is that the growth, cur or the, the growth parameters from the 125 ml shake flask in dark blue to the 50 and, and 1,000 liter reactors were almost right on top of each other. And so that really, again, goes to this um, inherent scalability of these cells. Um, surprisingly to us, this was um, less challenging of a scale up that we expected. And then if we look at into the, the uh, 5,000 liter reactor, in this instance, we had actually a little bit better growth in, in the 5,000 liter Dynadrive compared to the shake flask, or this may just be a one-off in terms of seeding, hitting the seeding densities perfectly, and then these cells growing up right, right to the time of, uh, of transfection. So on the, on the left here, you can see sort of that, that seed train. Um, and here we ended up at the time of transfection, it's normally about 3 million cells. We were about 4 million. Um, simply because we were a little bit limited in the media that we had uh, left in the seed train, so the cells couldn't quite quite get diluted down to the their their typical three million starting point. So with any AAV run, there's two key parts of the process. One is the cell health. Um, so we we tell folks that we work with that if your cells are not growing at least as well in the reactors as the shake flask, don't bother to transfect them. Work on your work on your upstream conditions, get them correct um, to have your most productive runs. And secondly, and we won't go into that here, but complexing is a, is a big, uh, is the second thing that you have to be really careful about. And in this case of a thousand liter run, we were making a hundred liters of, of DNA transfection reagent complex. So this ended up being in a single use uh, bio container, uh, VPC bioprocess container that was actually in a, uh, on, a, on a dolly. And it was hand mixed uh, at this point to, uh, to get a, a hundred liter complexation reaction. But what you see during the viral vector um, uh, dynamics during production, so we transfect at, at day zero, we harvest 72 hours later once, once uh, uh, AAV production is, is completed. And once again, you see remarkably from a 30 mil culture in a 125 ml shake flask to a thousand liter run, these kinetics are, are almost spot on top of one another. Um, so that allows for, again, um, this notion of um, scaling your 293 all the way from the, be the beginning, your bench scale, um, through clinical and commercial production. Very similarly, you expect to see that the, glu the glucose traces are quite comparable based on the VCDs. And again, you see this in blue is through the 50 liter bioreactor and then dark blue again, control shake flask into the, the thousand liter reactors. You have very similar glucose consumption rates. Uh, lactate stays quite low uh, across all of the runs, um, which, is a, which is a good thing, as well as uh, the ammonia stays very low during all of these runs. So when we look at, for example, our uh, physical or infectious titers, if we look at a, a 30 ml culture in blue versus a thousand, ML, a thousand liter culture in, in yellow, we're basically right on top of each other. Um, and then in terms of uh, infectious titer, and I, I will call out these, the error in this assay is, is definitely more, uh, more uh, prevalent uh, than in the, the physical titer measurements, but certainly our, our infectious titer for our 1,000 liter run is, is at least as good as um, for the 30 mil uh, shake flasks. So lastly, um, we utilize in conjunction with some of our, our in-house cryo-EM team to put together a three-angstrom three map of the AAV6 capsid using our cryos uh, G4 cryo-EM. 
Uh, this is, in fact, the purified AAV6 that, that came from this run. And uh, cryo-EM also plays a, a key role in, in uh, elucidating the empty, intermediate, and full species of the AAV capsids that are, that are coming out of the runs. Um, so obviously, we're looking for these, uh, these full capsids, getting a high percentage of those full capsids, which is very dependent upon your upfront conditions, your plasmid ratios, uh, choice of promoters, et cetera. Uh, but once again, we can see these truly empty capsids. Intermediate capsids are very interesting in terms of AAV biology. The intermediate capsids can be any number of things. They can be residual uh, plasmid DNA that's getting encapsidated. They can be host cell DNA that's getting encapsidated. They can be partial genomes that, in theory, would, would not be uh, infectious uh, being encapsidated uh, into the, the, the AAV uh, 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 virions. And then again, you have a, a nice uh, representation of a, a full capsid coming from the, the cryo-EM maps. So with that, um, I will end for today, and um, uh, happy to take any any questions that you may have. But hopefully, um, you know, given a little bit of information where we can, you know, not say that the two nine three cells are the little little brother of Cho cells. Uh, they really have uh, key applications: protein expression, viral vectors, and certainly into things like exosomes. Now, um, two nine three cells, pretty much anywhere new biology is going, they they tend to be a, a leader in that space. So. Thank you very much for attending and uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah. So you showed a lot of phenotypic data on the stability of those cell lines. Have you looked at them genomically? I mean, the 293 cells through all of the multiple passages relatively stable. Yeah. Genetic. So I, you know, I think that's a, it's a great question. I will say that um, not at a large scale. So if you ever look at the karyotype of a 293 cell, you would think they're an alien organism. Okay, I, I want to say some of these, you know, their mean chromosome number are between 70 and, a, and 100 chromosomes. Um, so it's very difficult to really elucidate the genetic changes of, of the cells over time. Now, what I can say is that we have actually been able to find stretches, for example, in our VPC2 cell line where we can we can differentiate them using uh, primer sets to differentiate them from the parental cell line that they came from. And at least those changes that we've looked at have been heritable over, over many passages. But I think, it, generally speaking, we look much more at the phenotypic aspects of it because the genome is such a mess that it's really difficult to work with. I was curious, perhaps this is something, but in the A, potential, um, is there ever an immunogenic? Sure. Yeah, so I would say um, pre existing neutralizing antibodies to AAV is a major problem with AAV therapy. So, against the capsid proteins themselves, um, I, I want to say that it's at least 50% of people that are eligible have some level of neutralizing antibodies. And then depending on the, the different, um, you know, clinical protocols, they either will exclude those patients or they will still treat them. But really, you have kind of one shot at, at getting it right with AAV because you're going to develop um, uh, neutralizing immunity to, to, the, to the capsids. With regards to the gene of, genes of interest, um, I, I've heard less about, less about that, but it certainly is an issue and you're your sequence needs to be, you know, created correctly to give yourself the best chance at having that um, uh, that protein. But once once AAV is expressing it in the human in the actual human cells in vivo, I guess one would hope that those po post translational modifications would be correct for that patient, um, and that you would have less likelihood of having immunogenicity against those derived uh, proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think I think it's 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 evolving, and I think um, you know vector design, your 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 sequences, all of that is critical in terms of looking at all of these things. But certainly, immunogenicity is a is a big um, concern in the field. Uh, yeah. So um, the, the glycosylating processes of X nine two nine three versus SF nine are vastly different. And uh, in our experience, when I was 
22 circle area that had two nine trees on really very complex, very heavily glycosylated. Um, I'm wondering, does, does that have kind of downstream effects as far as therapeutic? Because uh, the SF9s are mostly high mannose and they target different cell lines with dendritic uptake or something like that. Is there any indication that there's a, there's a difference from because of the different glycosylation patterns on, on, the, on the viral target? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think that's, I don't think it's fully understood and having been looked at in a, in a comparative setting of, you know, AAV insect versus 293. And it, it also depends on the glycosylation of, of the capsids. So some of these capsids have very little um, glycosylation on them, actually. Question, yeah. Is there a difference in the packing or the efficiency of packing? So I would say, you know, we've done some NGS on AAV made in both systems and, you know, anecdotally, um, and please don't take this to be gospel, um, for the AAVs and some of the genes that we looked at, we felt that the packaging quality of the 293 cells was slightly better than the insect. The insect had more truncations, more extra extra sequences in there that, that we didn't expect to see. Um, but that's a very limited study. And I think, you know, you have to your vector design, you know, whether it's for mammalian or insect, really has to be optimized, and that's not where we're focused. So basically, on the reagents that we had at hand, one versus one, I'll say that 293 looked very good. Insect always look, also looked very good, but you could pick up some nuances in the insect cells that we didn't see in the 293 cells. Yeah. Carter? It's it's just it's just a clonal cell line selected basically for its ability to express difficult to express moieties. So this, this parent, uh, from from its original inception, yes, and then it, it it's part of sort of the the XP two nine three VPC lineage. And then, um, how can you provide other non viral particles cell line? The density for me is extremely exciting. Sitting up there to show the tail cell line and then go to the system. So, if you try a non viral part inside the system, it can be yeah, so, you know, it, it depends. So the answer is yes. So when we selected these cells, we looked at some, some proteins that we also knew were difficult to express. Um, this system is really not, because it's a 72-hour system, it's not really set up to do protein expression because you'll, essentially at 72 hours, these cells have utilized their nutrients, their lactate, and, uh, you know, at that point, they, the virus is also shutting the cells down um, from, from productivity. Um, so generally speaking, you know, the, the cell line has good capabilities to express, difficult to express moieties, lentivirus, adenovirus, um, sort of across the board there. Uh, and, and interestingly, as, I, as mentioned, you know, we've grown these cells up sort of in a, in a batch-fed amber process to 50 million cells per mil. Um, so in theory, this cell line, for example, the, the parental VPC or XP293 will not, will not allow you to get that high. They, they can't handle the osmo. So this cell line actually has osmo characteristics that are more like a Cho cell rather than, uh, than these parental 293. So that should allow for a lot of flexibility in terms of intensified processes, perfusions, et cetera, you know, as, uh, as some of these methodologies may become more advanced. I know I went, I'm way over time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, we just have to yeah. change it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to come over here and talk today about proteins. Uh, Kemp proteins, we love difficult to express hard programs. While we, of course, love occasionally having those easy proteins to express and just send out super easily, uh, most of our team really gets excited by challenging difficult targets. My name is Carter Mitchell. I'm the Chief Science Officer at Kemp Proteins, and we've been around in some form or another for about 30 years making uh, proteins, utilizing initially SF9 expression systems, Chris Kemp, uh, early on in, in the late 1900s. Uh, but what we've done is, is really to, to kind of redefine what we believe the bioservices industry should look like. Uh, we are taking more of a collaborative approach to really understand what it is that a client is needing in their protein targets, whether this be a therapeutic, a diagnostic, or a reference material. Uh, vaccine candidates, we just really want to understand what it is that they're looking for and their intended purposes for these materials. Oftentimes, they, they actually don't know what they want. They think they know what they 
want. And then you start asking them questions and they realize they're in the wrong expression system, they're using the wrong expression vector, and maybe their process is extremely dangerous. <laughs> so what we try to do is, is to really understand how we can help our clients wherever they are in the developmental cycle for, for their programs of interest. And, and really one of the main focuses we are looking at is quality. We find it important, as, as Dom had mentioned, that garbage in is garbage out. And so we can provide garbage proteins if that's what you'd like, but the end result is going to be garbage. For structural biologists, whether it's therapeutics or vaccine candidates, to be honest, I don't want to inject an animal with agar, ag, you know, uh, man, high molecular weight aggregate protein, because you're not gonna get the type of response that you would from a, from a real life situation. Uh, and just so you guys are aware, we are in Maryland, just down the road, uh, we're a stone's throw from John. Uh, and in fact, we could probably walk right over there to Thermo Fisher. And, and <laughs> sometimes they come over and talk to us as well. Uh, but the way that we think about you know, a, a system is, or a, a question when a client comes to us is, is we really want to understand what is the protein, what info is available about the protein of interest, uh, what's the intended use, and really what is the quantity that's required. You can ask a lot of clients this, they want a kilogram of protein, and you're like, you don't really want a kilogram of protein right now. You're in your early stages of development. We do want to understand what the intended purpose is so that we can design a process with scale in mind, whether that be a high throughput platform that's customized so that they can look at biospecifics or vaccine candidates and BLPs. We're here to help them develop a flexible platform that specifically fits their intended purpose. And you know, this type of slide really does kind of capture how complicated these processes can be. We could take the old school of approach and be like, let's put a his tag on the N or C terminus and hope it works in E. coli. Or you can step back and state, well, you do need post-translational modifications that look like an infection. And so if you're wanting to do a vaccine candidate, we would recommend being in HEK293 because it's probably going to look much more like the virus infecting the host, and that's the type of molecules we want to develop for reference material, for qualification, characterization, and reference tools uh, to, to assist during the developmental process. And so once we have these initial questions answered, we kind of put it through our separation funnel here to try to understand how we will be able to derive the process that can deliver the molecules with the critical quality attributes of interest. We go through rounds of sequence optimization, we're using in, you know, actual analytical tools, process analytical tools to understand are we capturing those critical quality attributes and have we identified any critical process, process parameters uh, through the upstream and downstream process that we can gain control of. At the end of the day, we want to be able to provide this protein again and again, or we want to provide a method that's transferable to a GMP facility so that even they can do it. And uh, this really is kind of an iterative process, right? We here state that the downstream process is going through its uh, over and over again. The output is going back in and through this, this type of uh, workflow. The reality is, is the upstream process is also dovetailing into that as well. And so utilizing process analytical tools increases the likelihood of developing a successful procedure that's going to be able to scale. Once we have these answers in place, we go through a range of bioinformatic analyses. We now understand what the peptide or protein sequence or target is and what the end goal or use is for the molecule. We do a lot of literature research uh, to understand what we can learn about the protein as its biologically relevance and significance inside of the host. We look at protein interactions with other uh, databases like String, what types of proteins might be co-purifying or interacting with this protein that can challenge the target. We also want to understand uh, of course, uh, is it going to be secreted? Can we secrete the protein? Do we need to have it secreted in order to have the post-translational modifications that are required? Glycosylation prediction, et cetera. As we go down each one of these pathways, we then narrow uh, the opportunities that we can use or employ to be able to develop the process that's going to be successful for the, for the, the end user. Uh, going through Unipro, it's really nice, but of course, that's relying on a lot of other data that's already been kind of put together inside of this aggregator. And some of that data is not very good. And so it's hard to be able to determine uh, what data we should trust and what data we shouldn't trust along the way. Uh, you do kind of learn, though, as you go through 
thousands of protein structures, which um, types of paths are going to make you feel. I, I, I don't like using feel when I'm talking about science, but some of these elements are a little bit of a black box, and it's hard to predict what the success is going to be. And so uh, util utilizing, you know, of course, your own expertise and experience along the path uh, does provide a little bit of a better um, focus, I guess, from the experiences that you've already dealt with in your laboratory. Uh, of course, going through BLAST-P to look for uh, homology, as well as uh, are there actual homologs in the expression host that you're looking at. Um, I'm a structural biologist by training, so I always look at protein structures. I want to know where I can put a tag. Is there an oligomeric or dimeric interface? And all of these types of answers really are helping us understand the best route with which we can develop a process that's going to be successful. Um, here, at this point, we're looking at where the tag placement could be. Are we going to generate a transmembrane domain containing protein or not? If so, how are we going to do that? And what excipients do we want to add through the process? Um, and then by this point, we are now kind of understanding or converging on what that construct would look like in the expression system should be. We look at sequence liabilities for deamidation or any post-translational modifications that, of course, the client is, is specifically requesting. And by this point, we can then generate the protein parameters and biophysical parameters that are informative for uh, the people doing the work to understand what they should be looking for for the process. And then that now develops a process workflow where we know we can capture using analytical, uh, I'm sorry, um, anion exchange chromatography followed by CHT, and do we need to put in viral clearance or inactivation along the path, all of these kind of work into our, our process workflow and the, and the modeling design. All of this kind of comes together to allow for us to have a feasibility score and the likelihood of success for the programs that we're working with. Once we go through those types of analyses, we understand different types of engineering modes that can go into this, whether they be fusions, nanoparticles, you know, ectodomains, VLPs, and the like. All of those kind of dovetail into and allowing us to choose the expression mode that's going to give us the highest likelihood of success. For the types of molecules where there's not a lot of information available, we might select all expression systems that we have. And we can go through 96 different constructs and three different expression organisms and microscale expressions and purification to try to find the preferred candidates to select and move forward with. Um, some of these types of case studies could be we've done 48 different sequences that were derived from a machine learning process. We do the expressions and um, purification followed by bio, the analytical assessment and provide the data package back to the client which then they put back into the machine learning algorithm and comes to the next iteration of whatever protein targets we're specifically looking at. So currently, we've been doing all of these types of processes with me, going through the bioinformatic analyses to generate the constructs. We have thousands of processes that have been successful utilizing these types of strategies. And the, it's great, right? It works all right. We have a person doing this type of work, and it's taken a lot of years of experience to be able to develop these types of processes. Uh, but th to be honest, what we're actually doing is, is developing the, the foundation for an expert system. So let's take all of those routines and put them into a consolidated place and export all of that data. And we take that type of information to start to develop the processes utilizing an artificial intelligence and machine learning process. What's great about it is that it really takes the scientist kind of out of uh, play. We don't have to focus so much. We can actually develop many more processes simultaneously and have a higher likelihood of success. And, and it makes it so that it's actually something that other people might be able to use in the future as well. Anybody can really develop these types of models, but the data is what's so critical. So as we've gone through this process of developing our expert system, we actually found some of the routines that I've been relying on for so long are actually wrong. And they've been trained on a limited number of data sets, and, and they're not coming out with the correct predictions. Uh, similar to what Dom was stating about the secretory tag, whenever you start to do mass spec on secreted proteins, you find that that starting position is not 100% identical. And that heterogeneity leads to questions whenever regula the regulatory boards are looking through your documentation. And so part of what we've done so far is, is found that the secretory prediction, the subcellular localization, and the glycosylation prediction algorithms through the DTU are short-sighted and, and not robust enough to handle difficult, uncharacterized proteins. So it's heavily biased towards the proteins that it was initially trained on years ago. 
And what's really important from my point of view is that almost every day we should be updating our databases and the way we think about bioinformatics to come up with a better informed process. I would say 10, 20 years ago, you could probably come up with a process that would be suitable for about three to five years. Now it seems like about every six months you probably want to change the way that you're thinking about some of these projects because of the technological advancements that have been occurring. So we're actually going to be publishing a paper, I think, tomorrow on the subcellular localization using triplet loss in order for us to identify uh, the journey that the proteins will be going for. And, and what's great about these types of, and we'll also be publishing the glycosylation and the secretory um, uh, documentation as well. What we're doing though is specifically looking at all organisms because a lot of our clients come to us, they're not looking for traditional proteins that are just found in, in you know, the human genome. We're working with heavily engineered proteins that don't exist in nature. And how do you predict a good pathway for something that doesn't exist? And to me, I find that to be an exceptional challenge. And so what we've done is produced a truckload of different proteins from different systems over the years. We're not focused on just antibodies, which a lot of machine learning algorithms are really heavily focused on these types of molecules, which is biasing their data set. We're taking a more agnostic approach where we're looking at all types of macromolecules that we might experience uh, and that we have experienced in the past and using these to train our system so that we can come up with an agnostic type of database that can increase the likelihood of success in predicting a pathway that will work for a protein. So we've taken all of the previous data that we've generated over the time and then we've now incorporated our design process and it can predict critical process parameters in silico, and it really decreases the total risk that's associated with a, a process discovery and therapeutic uh, developmental workflow. Workflow. So really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to identify potential liabilities in a process, identify the expression and purification conditions, and suggest the process analytical tools that are going to ensure that you have the critical quality attributes that are required for the protein that, uh, that is being uh, designed. But all of this really requires flexibility with an expression system. We can't just have one, and John, actually, I agree with you. I think that if I chose one, it would be HEK293. It's, it's a very good system that produces proteins that look great, and you can take advantage of a lot of technologies to target them in specific locations. But at the end of the day, we have to be flexible. And you also have to be able to build processes understanding what the current precedence is. So regulators are expecting to see something. And if you show them a new, brand new technology, you're going to have to provide a lot of data to support why you selected this new technology. The more questions that they have, the less likelihood that you're going to be able to get this product through. And therefore, we want to try to answer those questions before they're ever asked. So I think being agnostic to the expression system is very critical in being able to develop successful processes. If you look at one protein target, 96 different sequences, three, four, five different expression systems, the likelihood of success is much higher. So at the end of the day, how important is that protein to you? And so with us, we're, we're working with HEK, CHO, SF9, SF21, TME, and then E. coli, Saccharomyces, Pickia, and we're moving into Bacillus. We just want to be able to work with all of these components and also implementing cell-free modalities because a lot of the proteins we work with are actually toxic to the host. So by taking it out of the cell, you actually don't have the toxicity issues that you've experienced before. And that's both with E. coli as well as tobacco cells that have been working pretty well, and we're currently working on some mammalian cell-free systems as well. People always ask questions about post-translational modifications. Well, that's always a question, and you can answer it utilizing sophisticated techniques and optimize a lot of these parameters. But what ended up happening for one of our clients is that we had a difficult protein to express. It was a toxin subunit, and we went into CHO, HEK, baclovirus, and microbial sources and didn't have any success. And we decided to just really try one last attempt, where we did a collaboration with a group called Frontier. And Frontier produces insects for the agricultural industry. And they specifically are using TME. So they make larvae in very, very large scale in a controlled environment. And we can inject baclovirus inside of these larvae to produce pre-occluded virus. You then can chop up those larvae and feed them back to themselves. And then 
actually do a large scale production for very difficult protein targets utilizing the larva themselves. So here's that previous graphic that I showed. There's our cup of worms that we got from Frontier sent frozen. They have to send them frozen to you. Um, and what we did was actually process them using old school separation techniques of the whole larva. Uh, you could see the frothiness and actually Mariah had uh, nightmares the day after seeing these worms floating around as they're being blended up, you know. But what we were surprised is actually the melanization that occurs. And so our first round, we didn't realize that you need boatloads of reducing agent to produce, to prevent this melanization process from happening because it actually just makes all processing impossible. You have this high molecular weight garbage that's modifying all of the proteins inside of the, the solution and it ruins your columns, your filters and everything. So what we're doing is 25 gram processes to optimize the downstream process. And what we found so far is 25 grams of larva is producing more than one liter of HEK or uh, high five, which is not bad because we have two and a half kilograms of worms in the freezer. We just got to figure out how to develop a scalable process that can actually tolerate chopping up all these worms into tiny pieces. But it's really important to think about how you develop a process. And so how we work is phase one is process modeling, identify routes in silico that can help and look for liabilities in our process development and discovery. And then process two or phase two, it's actually empirically scouting these based off of our process modeling and feeding these back into our DOE models so we can optimize the process and come up with an intensified process that can scale. And from here, we also want to start considering the regulatory requirements and development, development of the process analytical tools using the reference materials that we have. And then, of course, phase three, we're looking for uh, preferred variable ranges, confidence in our workflow. We work with the worst case material so that when you are in a GMP manufacturing campaign, you don't have anything uh, going wrong. And then at that point, you develop the batch record and have confidence in the transfer. But again, with that whole component of confidence, you want to be able to gain control of your processes by developing stable cell lines or generating the molecular tools that are required for your release assays. With the cell and gene therapy taken off the way it has, many of the proteins that they are working towards are disease state proteins, and they're extremely hard to make. They're not stable. These point mutations are really problematic. And so developing uh, reference materials and uh, um, molecular tools to help address the cell and gene therapy market has been a big challenge. Um, to me, I found it to be quite fun. It's very difficult. Uh, what's really nice is when everybody at the table understands that they're difficult projects. Uh, there's nothing worse than a client that doesn't know that what they're asking for is nearly impossible. Now with that, this is the team of uh, people at Kemp Proteins that we've been constantly building. Uh, we're a skilled set of scientists, and everybody is just constantly uh, improving their processes, and that's really a, a major focus for us, is a continual improvement in the quality of what we're producing. Um, and with that, again, my name is Carter Mitchell. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Have time for maybe one question. But please feel free to talk to the speakers after the event. Yes. So have you, uh, have you tried to do like a blind study with your AI on a random person as a brain? Have you done that? Have you showed that that, that, that works? I'm, I'm just curious about the, uh, the more intuitive implementation. Yes. So we're not at the place yet where we have an inference model that's going to be able to predict the entire process. I think in about six months, we should have that worked out. Right now, we have the expert system and the logic tree identified, and we're in the process of starting to train. Uh, just the expert system alone has decreased the time for gathering all the data, the structural analysis alignments into a report that's about 25 pages in about four and a half to five seconds, when that took me probably about an hour you know, 15, 30 minutes before. Uh, so it's already provided a lot of value there, and that is correct. Uh, so I'll be happy to share that with you once we have more, more data. Yes, sir. So I was interested when you mentioned your nervous or hesitant about the field, describing the process there. On those parts that are going to be deeper, those parts of the process now, or some of them, 
the way that I look at it is, is we are a neural network, right? And so there are elements of my processing that maybe I don't fully understand. And that's where I use feel. I hate the word feel. Um, as a scientist, you need data to make these decisions. Uh, so what I'm hopeful for is that we will be able to understand some of the elements of my processing that are going to fall out through the implementation of the system, and then we'll have higher confidence into why this approach works as opposed to this is Carter's approach and it, it's worked in the past. The other component that's critical is developing something called uh, nearest neighbor. Right? By putting in a sequence, we can then find processes we've already done in the past that we know are probably going to work. And so we'd have somewhat of an intrinsic bias on some of those programs. But by having a supervised and an unsupervised model, when we find convergence between those two pathways, we're, we're going to see these head-to-head -head comparisons time and time again. Yes, sir? So do you use public source for some of your structural data that it's imported or your literature that's imported into your algorithm? And do you rely on public, publicly vetted uh, systems for the, the vetting process, or do you do any other vetting yourself? For your algorithm the answer is yes, uh, but the online Mendelian inheritance of man, AMEM, is a curated source of literature about proteins, and I highly recommend sending them a dollar and utilizing their, their, their place. If I type in a protein sequence into AMEM and I have a sentence, I know this is going to be really, really hard. There's no data that's present. Uh, but as far as structural is concerned, I use Protein data bank, I use AlphaFold, and I use internal model generations uh, because all of them I look for convergence. And some of our protein targets actually adopt 5, 10, 15 different structures based off of the disease state and where we are and post translational modifications. I need to know about all of that in order to move forward. But structural biology for me is very critical in understanding how to derive a process that's going to work. Where's the tag going to go? Can we tag it? And what are the uh, you know, cystines and whatnot that are involved inside of these systems? But I actually take some comfort in looking at NMR structures and seeing the structural variability. I see that as a disordered region means that it probably is interacting with another protein. Not that it just is unstructured. It's just that it adopts different structures throughout its maturation process and journey. Thanks. So let's thank again our amazing speakers, Dom, John, and Carter, for, the, for their presentations. And I also would like to acknowledge our sponsors for today's event, which is uh, Mag B. Moore and Vanik and Rosie, the representative. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and the uh, Frederick County Chamber of Commerce uh, for helping us organize the event. And uh, last but not least, we have fourth and final for this year by Tech Connector event, November 16th, where we dive into the mass spectrometry and proteomics uh, topic. So please stay tuned. Thank you so much for coming and help yourself with the coffee and pastries. And uh, if you have any more questions to the speakers, yeah, please ask. <laughs>